the trouble is that there's a huge amount at stake, billions and billions of dollars in terms of profits that companies could make. So they've, they've got a really big stake in keeping things as they are. They've got their own research that they fund, mm -hmm. experts that they turn to. And so it becomes a, a case of, you know, sort of our science versus your science. And our, in fact, one of the things you quote in the book is that you often get that from manufacturers that your science is bad, your science is not, it's not good science and so on. And we've seen the, the same kind of debates in the past with the tobacco industry. We've seen the same kind of thing with the, the climate change debate at the moment. How do you counter that? Yeah, well, well in fact, the, the reason it's the same debate is because the same uh, uh, government relations companies are hired to manage those issues. The exact same people that were doing tobacco do toxic chemicals and do climate change. There's a few companies in Washington that basically control all of these things. And uh, it's, you know, in some ways, it, I think it's, it's easy to counter with the public because the public basically knows better. Like, they, just, they simply don't trust these companies. Uh, it's tougher when it comes to governments. And frankly, it's, it's tougher sometimes with the media because you get this idea that, you know, even though there's 7,000 scientists that say it's bad and two say it's good, uh, you get this idea that, well, we need to have a balanced debate. So we'll get one of the two that says it's good and we'll get one of the 7,000 that says it's bad and we'll have a debate on TV. And that's a big problem. Uh, I think, um, uh, but I, I think in this issue, unlike climate change, in fact, we, Rick and I were remarking on it when we were touring around North America, we didn't get anybody th that has said, other than a couple of, you know, well-known right-wing columnists um, in, the, in, the, like, in the Wall Street Journal and stuff, uh, like nobody said we were crazy. Whenever we speak, no one's like, oh, I don't believe you, or that doesn't make sense, or why is this happening? Uh, I think people intuitively have a sense that you shouldn't put these things in products and then feed your kids. Like it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of common sense that's supporting what we're, what we're talking about. I'm going to ask you a very naive question now. Why are governments so slow to respond? Why, why are governments part of the problem in the sense that you've, you present a lot of evidence to them about you know, the damage that's being done, but you don't get that kind of immediate response. It's like, oh, is the, this is the common sense approach. Let's protect people. Why don't we get that? Well, I think that's starting to change. And in the book, you know, after freaking you all out here, talking about all the problems with these products that are for sale across the road, um, I, should, I want to underline the book is actually quite hopeful. Uh, because we demonstrated that through being a more careful consumer by reading labels a little bit more carefully, you can actually navigate uh, these products fairly successfully. Um, governments are, are usually slow to react when, when faced with complica complicated issues, right? And we do have a complicated situation in a regulatory sense right now because the chemical industry has been largely unregulated for 50 years. You know, it doesn't matter whether we're talking Australia, North America, Europe's getting a little bit better. But uh, th this is an industry that has largely been allowed to run its own affairs, unfettered by any government oversight, well, for, and for half a century. Yeah, and in fact, the, the, the chemical, uh, chemical regulatory system that we have in most industrialized countries uh, was really designed by the chemical companies, not by governments. I mean, that, that's the really scary part. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you're asking these questions because they're really important questions and not a lot of people uh, get into the details. But we have now, uh, and we, we write about this in the book, we have uh, what's, what we call sort of a risk-based approach to chemical regulation. And what that means, and you'll hear you know, chemical companies talking about this, that... Uh, uh, you know, you have to prove, you know, sort of beyond any reasonable doubt that a chemical causes very specific harm. And that was like the tobacco debate's a perfect example, right? Uh, doctors knew 50 years ago that, uh, that uh, tobacco caused cancer, and lead is another example. For 100 years, they tried to get lead banned in gasoline. We knew, knew it was very toxic. Uh, but we've set up this regulatory system that demands so much information and so much certainty and that whole system was really designed by the chemical companies, knowing that uh, it was going to be impossible to prove that there was harm, that, uh, that, that, that governments basically you know, look to that system that they have and say, well, we can't do anything because according to our rules... As opposed to the other way around, right? right? Where, where, where you need to demonstrate... A, I mean, one would think 
you know, from common sense that you should, you, if you're a company making something, you should demonstrate that that product is safe mm -hmm. prior to being able to sell it. Mm -hmm. But what we have at the moment is, is entirely the opposite situation where the onus is on charities, is on uh, public interest groups to demonstrate there's a problem mm -hmm. prior to a product being yanked from, from the marketplace. It's a bit like medications that before they go... It's, pharmaceut it's exactly yeah, right there. So pharmaceuticals uh, yeah. have the... The, the right way of doing things. Right? You have to prove it's safe before it gets into the marketplace, but not chemicals. What about the agencies? I mean, you, at one point you talk about the Consumer Product Safety Commission that actually cleared PVC toys at one stage as being safe for, mm -hmm. for human contact. Why, why was the, you know, that, that's a, you know, one of the uh, gatekeepers in the process. Why didn't that, at that point, why didn't they say, stop, this is not going to work? Well, there wouldn't have been uh, uh, many studies done on it, for example, or studies that are done. Uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of people don't realize that most of the, the safety studies done are actually done by the chemical companies that produce the chemicals, and then government reviews those. So we just simply don't have, uh, have the rigor in the system to, to come to the right decisions. Though, though, though that is changing, and I think when we talk about this in the book, um, things have changed dramatically uh, with the advent of the web. And, uh, I mean, this is sort of a complicated area. It's about chemicals uh, with funny names, uh, mm. thousands of them. Mm. Um, products, you know, like this shampoo that has, you know, a, a very extensive uh, ingredient list with these unpronounceable chemical names. The web has changed things uh, dramatically in the last few years. So, so now you can go online, and some of our colleagues in the States have done extensive product testing. You can, you can take a look at specific brands figure out uh, what chemicals are in those things. You can compare products uh, for uh, less and more toxic product alternatives. I'll mention what those are. They're, they're really, really good. There's one called uh, the Skin Deep database and one called uh, safecosmetics.org. And you can find a lot of information at an organization called uh, Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. And they, like it's fantastic information. And not only is that information now on the, on the Internet, but... The internet's providing uh, ways of people to communicate and work together. So we've been dealing with, uh, you know, these great parents groups and mothers groups and breast cancer groups uh, that that really are leading this. So it's it's uh, it's much less of a, you know, when people say you know call this an environmental book, I always say, well, it's not an environmental book; it's a health book because really at the end of the day, these are health issues. Mm. Well, let's talk about the, the experiments that you did and the you know, things you did to your bodies. You mentioned uh, early on about your families thinking you're maybe a little bit crazy doing this kind of thing. And I mean, that sounded quite funny, but you must have had a serious discussion with them because there were real dangers, right? You didn't know what could possibly happen, what the long-term results might be. Well, it was, it was kind of, on the one hand, you can, there's two ways of looking at our experiments. On the one hand, it is slightly crazy that we deliberately exposed ourselves to these chemicals, knowing what we know about them. But on the other hand, we really didn't do anything that millions of people in Australia and Canada do every day. Uh, I mean, we shampooed our hair, we ate tuna fish, we, um, you know, we drank out of baby bottles. We watched TV. <laughs> we, uh, you know, we watched lots and lots of TV. Um, we uh, sat on sofas. So, I mean, there was a certain... Uh, Frankly, the very mundaneness of the experiments, the, the, the workaday aspect of the experiments, made it feel very strange sometimes to be so thoroughly planning them. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, we actually had charts on the wall to plan out versus tuna fish sandwich eating <laughs> experiment. Right. Um, you don't normally sort of think, ooh, gee, I'm going to have a blood test. I just had a tuna sandwich. Yeah. You know, but, um, but, but each, each of these chemicals we're looking at has a different characteristic in the human body. Each of them is flushed from our bodies in, in, a, in a different time period. Uh, for some of the experiments, we tried to actually depress our levels of these chemicals for a few weeks or months prior to trying to elevate them again. So that despite the mundane nature of the things we did, it took a lot to, to plan them out. And what, what we said to our families was, well, look... Uh, we're just doing things that, that we all do every day. But the only difference being that we're, we're going to thoroughly, we're going to methodically sample our blood and urine levels of these chemicals as we're going along. I had a slightly different approach. I said, uh, I'm going away on business for a few days. I'll uh, see you on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
My children are smaller than Bruce. So, <laughs> uh, so I have my child care responsibilities and more, make them more difficult to do. You know. So you had the, you starved yourselves and then you immersed yourselves and you had these elevated blood and urine levels. And then at some point you sort of tapered back to yeah. normal. So I'm sure some people are sitting there thinking, well, that sounds okay. You know, you kind of, you were exposed to this stuff and then you flushed it out. I mean, why is it so bad? Well, there's a couple of ways of looking at that. I think that's right. I mean, that is uh, the good news is if you stop using these products, some of them you'll see uh, a dramatic and immediate decline in the chemicals in your body. But uh, on the other hand, if uh, for people that are unaware and are using these things, like you know Colgate Total two or three times a day, uh, you th- these chemicals won't flush themselves out. They'll continue to build up in your body. So chemicals. Uh, uh, they all have different half lives, which mean they all leave your body at at, at different rates of uh, uh, at different rates. Uh, mercury, for example, one of the real problems is that it takes a long time for it to come out of your body. So if you're eating a lot of tuna, it's actually just going to increase in your body over time, you know, and and uh, and not you know the, the rate of it flushing out could be lower than the rate of it increasing in your body. So uh, so you do have to be careful, and as uh, uh, as we write about in the book, one of the real issues isn't so much the quantity, and that's, that's what's really new in the science about these chemicals. It's, it's, it's not the amount that you're exposed to, but the timing. So minute amounts that are introduced at a certain time as the body's developing can cause harm. And so we're talking you know, parts per billion that, uh, that can cause harm. Well, you know, West Virginia... Um, Blue Ridge Mountains, almost heaven, according to the John Denver song we all remember. Um, I think, mm-hmm. Bruce, it was you that went to, is it Parkersburg? Park- Parkersburg, West, West Virginia. Virginia yes, and yeah. you sort of, you mentioned briefly there, which was not exactly a piece of heaven, as you discovered, um, that not only was it being polluted by the local uh, industrial manufacturer, but they were kind of put in charge of determining what's the level of pollution and put in charge of monitoring whether it was being polluted or not. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was a, a real problem. I, I met with a fellow that, uh, that was leading the class action lawsuit there, a guy named Joe Keeger, and, uh, and he, later, he got a letter one day in the mail from the local water utility, and it said, uh, it said you have this chemical down, they call it C8 down there, it's the perfluorinated compound that's in Teflon, and uh, it, said, uh, it said, well, you have this chemical in your water, it's called C8, but don't worry, DuPont tells us it's safe. <laughs> And so he's like, okay, so DuPont is telling the water utility that I shouldn't worry. So he sent it off to the, the U.S. EPA. You can fry eggs on the sidewalk of a town and it doesn't stick. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. So, so there are some would, upsides to having yes. an entire town poisoned with Teflon. <laughs> That's right. And, and you could because when I, it was literally it was 100 degrees uh, when I, Fahrenheit when I was there. Um, so, uh, so the EPA got hold of this and started looking into it, and that actually led to the largest administrative fine in an in, uh, environmental administrative fine in U.S. history—a sixty-eight million dollar fine because Dupont didn't actually inform anybody that this chemical was in their water. So, in addition to the three hundred million dollar lawsuit, there was the sixty-eight million dollar fine. So, uh, uh, but the way the way I, I think of Parkersburg, really, you've got sort of three kind of rings of contamination. You've got the people that are working in the plant. And, uh, and what happened was DuPont, there, there's, a, there's a very particular birth defect that's associated with this chemical. And uh, DuPont decided they would look at the you know, women in the, in the, in the factory and, uh, and see if this birth defect would show up. And they, they thought to themselves, well, if one person has this birth defect, it's probably just a coincidence, even though it's like one in 10 million. It's a very unusual birth defect. And anyway, it found out in an in a area of the plant where there were five pregnant women, two of them had babies that had this very severe birth defect. So, uh, so they immediately you know, moved them to a different... So no pregnant women could work in that part of the plant anymore. They didn't, of course, stop, stop manufacturing. So there's the people in the facility that have serious problems, and there's the people in the town whose entire water supply is contaminated, 68,000 people that live there. And then the, the, uh, this chemical is also found in the blood of 95% of North Americans. So essentially, it's a pervasive chemical. It doesn't break down in the environment. Uh, it's found in the blood of polar bears in the Canadian Arctic. So you've got the people in the plant, the people in the town, and then all of the rest of us that, that have the chemical in our bodies. 
Was it also Parkersburg where the the man who is leading the, the lawsuit, the class action, his ne next door neighbor's house burnt down, and yeah. someone sort of facetiously or half facetiously said, "Oh, they got the address wrong." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's what joke. Do, do you feel any pressure in terms of? I mean, you're speaking out against very powerful corporations. Do you feel pressure to? Tone down that message. Does anyone sort of try to put that kind of pressure? Not that kind of pressure, but sort of pressure well, on you to. Well, we fly on different planes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, we have been very amused that the, whenever we're touring around the U.S., um, the chemical industry has been. At one point, they actually phoned up our publicist in the states to get our schedule and find out where we're mm. going to be and. Uh, um, so we're, we're delighted that they're keeping tabs on us, uh, <laughs> especially in the United States. Yeah. We've got a couple of mics on the, the sides there. If anyone has any specific questions you'd like Rick or Bruce to address. Um, but now that you've kind of you know, had this litany of woe um, and you know, how we're all going to hell in a handbasket, um, I looked to the final uh, chapter for some hope, and this is what I found. If at this point you're not casting your eyes around your home, seeing things in a new light, Perhaps you're looking at your sofa or bathroom contents with newfound suspicion. We've, we've clearly done something wrong. Even if you're inclined to go back to the land, as many were during the 1960s and 70s, to try to escape the, quote, pollution and poisoning of the land, water, and air by the waste products of concentrated urban life and of large-scale industry, it won't do you any good. There is no escape from pollution. Today's most serious toxins lurk in the most private recesses of our homes. We told you it was hopeful. Thanks very much, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to end on an uplifting... Uh, yeah. um, so uh, if that's the case, um, you know, in a sense, we're, we're saying that we can't get away from this pervasive pollution in, in our lives. So what are we supposed to do? Well, I think, I think we need to... If I can maybe put another layer in, on that, <laughs> that quote. Um, the point we're trying to make there is that there was a time where... Uh, if you were wealthier, if you lived at the right side of the tracks, if you lived uptown, away from those polluting factories, mm -hmm. then you could escape that pollution, right? If you, if you were uh, so of, of, of lesser means, uh, like the neighborhood I live in in East End Toronto, for instance, is the old industrial part of town. So if you lived in that part of town, you'd be surrounded by factories and you'd be breathing that in every day. If you lived in uptown Toronto, you wouldn't be breathing that in. So there was a time when you could literally escape from pollution. The, the point now is that these are all global brands. I mean, you know, Colgate Total Toothpaste is on sale all throughout the world. Uh, it's in millions of homes around the world. And so in that sense, in the sense that we all share these brands, we all are subjected to this advertising, we're all equally uh, subjected to this pollution. But the... But the good news is that if you're, if you're careful with, I mean, well, let's take toothpaste as an example. Um, if you go home tonight and buy the other kind of Colgate, I think it's called the uh, mint freshener or something. It has those <laughs> yummy little uh, flavor flex, you know. Yeah. If you buy the other kind of Colgate that doesn't have the pesticide in it, then you're, you're going to uh, see a dramatic decrease in your body and the chemicals. So there is a way of navigating this. Mm -hmm. Um, that's actually not terribly complicated. And, and I think too that the, you know, that there's you can do things immediately, as as Rick's describing, but as we were writing the book, there was so much happening around the world on on these uh, chemicals that it was hard to keep up with it. Uh, in Canada, while we were writing the book, initially the city of Toronto had a ban on cosmetic pesticides. By the time we finished the book. The entire province of Ontario had a ban on cosmetic pesticides, and now almost all of Canada has banned the use of cosmetic pesticides. Uh, you know, the, 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 the government of George Bush, not known for being environmentally very active, uh, banned phthalates in children's toys. Uh, the Canadian government banned bisphenol A in baby bottles. We're seeing state governments around the U.S. Uh, banning, and in Canada, banning different kinds of flame retardants. So. So at the end of the day, I think if people start becoming more aware, uh, this is just sort of a, a personal way of understanding these things better, then chemical companies, and, and not just so chemical companies, but the uh, manufacturers of these products that are, are, are very protective of their brands. You look like a, a brand like Colgate, a brand like uh, Johnson's. I mean, these are 
you know, billion dollar brands, they don't want to harm the credibility of their brand. So they're going to start behaving better once consumers show some concern. And then once you combine those two things, then governments will start to act. So at the end of the day, uh, we do need governments to take action to improve our regulatory systems and make sure that these chemicals aren't going in our products in the first place. So, you know, to keep our kids safe. Okay. Let's take a question. Sorry, I'm just wondering about babies' bottles and the teats and also the machines, the plastic machines that we use to sterilise babies' bottles. Do they leach chemicals? So the, um, you're, so the, you, you, you have a machine that sterilises the bottle? Yeah, usually you put the bottles into a machine and plug it in, and in six minutes they're completely sterilised. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm not familiar. <laughs> we, uh, in my neck of the woods, we put in a big pot of boiling water in the stove. But, uh, um, we're a bit but behind. In we're a bit behind. <laughs> Things are better here in Australia. But the, um, uh, well, what I say about that is that uh, any, whenever you heat plastic, and it doesn't matter what kind of plastic it is, uh, that, that degrades the material and the chemicals start leaching out of that, that bottle. And the nipples, the teats on the bottles, what do you do about that? Those are typically uh, silicon, or you should make sure that you're buying silicon uh, nipples. Um, and then you can, you can boil those because there's no problem. Yeah. Okay, we had a sudden rush of questions. We're running out of time, so just very quickly, please. Uh, is there any plans to do any more experiments for a sequel, and do you take requests? <laughs> <laughs> I you've never had that question yeah, before. <laughs> like a, yes and yes are the short answers. <laughs> we actually considered a number of very... Uh, we went through a series of uh, possibilities for experiments. Uh, so, for instance, um, you know that new car smell? When you buy a new car, it's actually quite a... We've grown accustomed to it. It's actually not an unpleasant odor. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of phthalates and volatile organic compounds off-gassing. So one of, the, one of the experiments we're fooling around with for our next book is actually... Uh, the new car smell experiment, where we <laughs> we sit in a new car and roll the windows up one hot summer's day and, and drive to Australia. And drive to Australia. <laughs> yeah. Just a quick question for Rick. Um, you've pointed out the negative side effect of chemicals, but what chemicals do you need to feed your children to get them to grow up to be six foot six? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew. The in incredible thing is, I used to be six foot eight until I did these experiments. <laughs> So this experiment actually took, took a couple of inches off of me. Gentlemen, I like the question about is there a sequel? So you've looked at seven chemicals. You refer to the fact that there are 80,000. How long will it take to investigate the rest? Uh, in 1998, I believe, the late Senator Ted Kennedy presented a list of chemicals to the US Congress and asked for them to be investigated, and he voiced his concern 12 years ago. What action came from that, and literally how long will it take to investigate these chemicals? Yeah, it was funny, because some, someone actually did that calculation, and it's like you know, 300 and some odd years. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the issue that we're getting at is, uh, is looking at, at classes of chemicals. So if... When we say there's 80,000 chemicals, you know, there, there's probably uh, several hundred perfluorinated compounds that are used in... So that, that's the chemical that's in Teflon. Uh, it's also in Stainmaster, Scotchgard, Gore-Tex. Uh, like there's hundreds of products. And they're all slightly different chemical variations. So what people are suggesting now is instead of looking at every single one of these chemicals, if they're in the same chemical family, then we should stop using them. So that's one way of dealing with it. Uh, in Canada, we've made some changes to the regulatory system, and in Europe as well, they have something uh, something called REACH, and uh, it's a new way of looking at chemo sort of fast tracking the chemicals, so that you you look at the properties of the worst chemicals, they get bumped up, and you start reviewing those. So there there are things that people are are trying to do now to uh, to to sort of fast track the system. If we did go to glass bottles and replace all the plastics and use cotton and hemp and paper, doesn't that place new pressures on the environment and create a, a problem that might outweigh the problem that you're solving? Yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's always trade-offs. I think you have to be careful with, uh, 
with chemicals that you're using, but um, or, or you know product substitution. But I would say the majority of the chemicals that we're talking about just don't need to be in the products, right? They're not they're non-essential ingredients, so you can eliminate them, and you don't really need you, you just take the triclosan out of here. You know, you don't uh, you, know, you don't add phthalates in the in the strawberry shampoo. Nothing, nothing, and frankly, very little is more energy intensive and more wasteful than plastic. I mean, if you add together the chemicals that go into the making of plastic, the pollution that's produced in the making of plastic, what happens to most plastic things after you're done using them, um, you know, glass is light years better than, mm. uh, than that. And the plastics are almost all derived from petroleum in the first place. Well, I've just been told we've got 30 seconds. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can you make it really quick? Uh, yeah. Does doing a detox or yoga or cleansing your body, is that going to help get rid of these things? Yeah, well, that's actually something we're looking at for the second book as well. I'm hoping to spend a month in a sauna. But, um, <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we, I, I I'm looking think, forward to his doing, to right. watching him do yoga. I think first and foremost, you, know, you want to avoid using these things. Um, but uh, you know, eating like, like basically the, what you hear from doctors for all kinds of things, drinking a lot of water, eating fresh vegetables and raw vegetables. I mean, that that will definitely help you detox. Not eating uh, for like three days or a week is that helpful? Yeah, I think. I, I mean, I don't really. You know, we haven't looked at, at any of those. There's all kinds of products now too that you can buy, sort of detox products, but we haven't evaluated them. First and foremost, what we wanted to demonstrate with, with this book and with our experiments is that simply uh, being more careful in what products you use is the best place to start. Okay, thank you. What are you going to do with all these products? <laughs> uh, they're actually for sale if anyone wants to. Uh... <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll autograph the toothpaste too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, uh, our two authors will be available to sign copies of Slow Death by Rubber Duck in the Ruth Cracknell room, which I believe is just one level up from here. Will you please thank Rick Smith and Bruce Lurie. Thank you very much.